If you're like, man, these clients are so interesting. I'm trying to learn the ins and outs so I can get rich and I can build the next Zoom. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if this is for you. Welcome back. Today's video is about really my practice. I've noticed that in the last year, well, it's probably been happening since before the past year, but I started noticing like in the past year that a lot of lawyers are trying to get into like the tech, venture capital, emerging companies, space, like all of that intertwined in one. While I think it's great that people are making the moves that make them happier and are finding that this is more exciting for them and all of that, I do think that there are a lot of myths with the practice. Like they're just, are, I don't even know if I would call them myths, but like there are a lot of things just like with anything else that you don't really realize until you start practicing. I was talking to a friend recently, which made me kind of think about this video. And she was talking about how she wants to leave her practice and like kind of do something with emerging companies or something with these kind of like new tech companies. And she wants to do it on the big law side. And I was like, okay, what are your expectations? And what do you want to get out of it? And she explained all of her expectations and I told her, I think you might want to do a specialist group. So that kind of got me thinking like, maybe I should do a video about this because it's not what people think, you know, just like everything else. Like, it's not always what people think. I actually made a list because I didn't want to forget anything. Let me just give a little background for people that just happened to cross this video and don't know who I am. <laughs> My name is Angel. I am a third year associate. I practice all types of emerging company stuff. And what that just means is that my clients are mid-sized to small-ish companies with a lot of money. Most of the time they have a lot of money. A lot of time they're tech companies. I do venture capital financings, um, investor side and company side. I've kind of helped with like general corporate stuff, they call it. What I mainly do these days though, is that I help these companies that are like a little bit later stage, like mid-ish size, some smaller, but like mid-ish size, nothing huge, like billion dollar deals, like my old firm, like they're not like that huge. I help them basically sell their company to someone who wants to buy their company. So that's called M&A, Origins Acquisitions. But before I started really doing mostly that, I was doing a lot of venture capital financing. And I still do them, but not as much. And I do more like M&A, sell side M&A now. All that's to say is that I'm speaking from experience. So that's why I give that little background. I'm not just like hearing from legal streets about what's, what it's like. Like I know firsthand what this practice is like. And that's why I can kind of tell you like, okay, what are your expectations? And I can let you know the practice is gonna meet that. So let's get started. One thing that you definitely, I think the biggest thing that you have to know, this practice is numbers galore, numbers galore. So in law school, I remember there was this running joke, like people become lawyers because they don't like math or they don't like numbers and all that. <sighs> Not in this practice, okay? These lawyers are good with numbers. They draft the spreadsheets themselves a lot of times. They can fact check the share price. There are calculations involved in these documents that really as a, on the legal side, you're supposed to be able to check. And that was so surprising to me because at my old firm, my old practice, I didn't do anything with numbers. The investment bankers did all of that stuff and they would just tell us what number to plug into the agreement, to plug into the contract, plug, plug into the, what word am I looking for? Filing. So I had no connection to cap tables, like beyond just copying and pasting them <laughs> into it really. Like I wasn't really heavily involved in that. I wasn't heavily involved. I never, never put together a spreadsheet. I never had to calculate me, like check the formulas, none of that. I wasn't doing any of that. This practice is completely different. There's a lot of numbers. There are a lot of spreadsheets. Let me pause right there. So if you're if you hear that and you're like, oh my God, I could never, ever, ever deal with Excel. I know a lot of people are scared of Excel. On the bright side of it, the formulas and stuff that you kind of have to know, like the venture capital, emerging company side, you don't have to know everything. There are a certain number kind of of formulas and I'm like, once you practice it and get the hang of it, you realize that you don't have to know, like you don't have to be a master at Excel, you just have to know what you're supposed to know, if that makes sense. I'm still learning it, so I can't tell you how long <laughs> it takes, but yeah, so you don't have to know everything. So hopefully <laughs> if you got scared when I said that, that kind of makes you a little less scared, but it is there and it is something that 
I don't know. I don't think it's talked about that much with like, I want to help small companies. A large part of it is that these companies, what they're going to pay a law firm to help them with is to raise money. <laughs> they're trying to like make more money. They're trying to come up. They're trying to invest in their business, expand their business. They're trying to, you know, do all those type of things, which actually brings me to point number two. And that is a large part of your work is going to be venture capital financing. Um, and that's a broad term. So sometimes they're equity financing, which means that the company wants to issue more shares. They want more people to own their company. Sometimes it's debt financing. So that just means they need more money, but they're going to pay these people back. I've realized financing is pretty broad in this space. And it just means getting more money to the table for these companies, smallish or mid-sized companies, some big, but not really, not like the huge Fortune 500, like none of those. A lot of your time is gonna be spent on financings. And the reason I say that is because people are like, I want to get into the space because the clients are interesting. And they are, the clients are interesting. Like the businesses are different, like I rarely, Besides like software companies, I would say, I rarely like come across the company I'm working with and I'm like, I've heard of a company exactly like this. Like, they're all kind of different. They'll have a different spin on it. They're all new. For the most part, the founders are like excited about the future of their company. So the businesses are interesting, but you are doing financings. So that's one of the things I was, the conversation I was having with my friend was that you have to realize that this is not a practice where you're necessarily going to learn the ins and outs of the new tech businesses. That's not really your job. Your job is to get to know the founders like personalities because <laughs> they are your client or the person you're serving. You're serving the company, but companies are made of people. So you're serving like the founders or the directors, really the directors, but directors and founders, usually there's overlap. Your job is like get to know their, their preferences, what they want, their expectations. So really getting to know their personalities. And that's what makes, for me, that's what makes this practice more interesting than the traditional practice because personalities can be eccentric, they're different, I haven't had, they're not robotic, they are excited, they have their different values for who they want to like bring along with them. Some of them are frustrated, some of them like in m &A, some of them don't want to be sold, some of them are mad about their being sold. Either positive or negative, it's, they're, they are dynamic personalities in this practice. So if you're coming into it, you're like, I want to work with more interesting clients because right now my practice is dull. Everyone on my calls, they sound like robots and you want like more life in what you're doing, then yes, this is the practice for you. If you're like, man, these clients sound so interesting. I'm trying to learn the ins and outs so I can get rich and I can build the next Zoom. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if this is for you because I just you just don't learn that much about the business like you learn you need to know the basics like I always kind of google them I always look at their website or whatever but the way that you're thinking you're gonna learn like the ins and outs not so much I think if you're buying a company so if you're so this is I'm talking about venture capital tech whatever a part of that is so that brings me to the next point oh this is just flowing so well <laughs> that brings me to my next point actually so with a lot of these firms this is all intertwined. So with a lot of these firms, you really, really have to be efficient with your time when you're working with these small companies because there's usually a fee cap involved or something like that to where they're not trying to play, pay a gajillion dollars because they don't have a gajillion dollars. So on the lawyer side, what's that mean? what that means is that you have to like, I don't know, you have to be efficient with your time. That's all I can really say about it. And like, yeah, sometimes that can be stressful when you're like, okay, they just, Someone just asked me to do this. It's gonna, I'm new at it, it's gonna take me a long time. So sometimes like, it involves write-offs or whatever like maybe the case, but it's like you have to really pay close attention to your time. And I've heard that some firms, like if they notice after a while, it's like you're not getting the hang of it, you keep having to write all your time off, they'll stop staffing you on it. <laughs> so of course that could be stressful. On one hand, you can't build too much to these clients because they can't afford it. On the other hand, you have these billable hour requirements, which I've noticed a lot of these firms that are starting to do like the tech new work, they have them. They have like minimum hour requirements for bonuses. So, you know, those two things are not really adding up. So one of the requirements I've seen often, it's at my firm, it's I've seen it at other places, is that you're expected to do emerging companies and venture capital, that's like usually like one group. You're supposed to do that with 
another practice. Sometimes that means you're doing both merging companies work, venture capital work, and M&A, which is what I'm doing. Sometimes that means, but now I'm kind of doing like, so they kind of call like, you can kind of think of it as like a major and a minor. Like if you want to major in like venture capital, you have to like minor in like cap markets or M&A or like something else or confirmation or whatever it may be. I, I've kind of switched them recently. So like my major is kind of like the sell side M&A just cause like, I like that. <laughs> I like the work there. I'm kind of like minoring in emerging companies now, but you know, you have a balance. Yeah, so the reason I say that is because some people come in and they're like, this is all I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna be doing working companies, yada, yada, yada. If you want a bonus, you know, and if you want to also just like not have a low, the local reputation. <laughs> and if you wanna help out the firm and pick up some slack because, you know, there's, these places are, these firms are really busy right now and they're kind of like, we need some team players because people are, some people are drowning. All of that considered, <laughs> you're gonna have to like pick up another practice with it. So yeah, manage your expectations with that. I was gonna say something else, but I kind of lost my train of thought. Okay, I'm like looking at my list. I kind of already said this, but financing is like the bread and butter of your practice. And one of the reasons I wanted to emphasize that is because someone compared financings to the logic games section of the LSAT. And I think it's a good comparison. Financings are more complicated than you would think, than I would think. Maybe, maybe you already know all this stuff. They're more complicated than I would think because there are like five main documents for the financing. Usually for like other practices, for example, like for merger, they're like the main documents. It's like a merger agreement and everything else is kind of like eh, but that's like the document. Same thing for cap markets, it was like, your document with like the filing, like you have this SEC file and it's like a big document and everything else is kind of like just helping that. That's not how financings are, there's five documents, they're all intertwined in some way. So if you need to make one change to one, or like one change to one number, or just one change to the deal, it ends up like flowing through most of them. So it kind of can take, it's a learning curve, but it can take some time to kind of realize like how they're all connected to each other, how they all feed off of each other, whatever. On the flip side of that, and the good side about it is that there are like these standard forms and these happen so often that what's seen as market, which just means like what happens the most often, what people usually negotiate and agree to, it's pretty public knowledge. There are forms you can check against and be like, okay, like this little clause you got right here, Y'all tried it. This old clause you got right here, this is not standard, whatever. So like there's, even though it's, to me it seems like kind of complicated, there are like objective ways to fact check it. But I say that also says that that's a big part of your practice. I wasn't like the biggest fan of Logic Games on the LSAT. That wasn't my, <laughs> that wasn't my sweet spot. I like to just read and answer the questions. And I liked the other one. Logical reason, I can't even remember, logical reasoning. So when she compared this to Logic Games, it was like a self-awareness moment like, ah, that's probably one of the reasons why I like the sell side of M&A so much more because I'm not really that into like these missing pieces, <laughs> all these different pieces. Um, but yeah, so just keep that in mind, keep that in mind, I'm just here to give y'all information. Other myths, I guess you can say, or reasons people wanna get into this practice because they're like, I'm gonna work for founders, I'm gonna work for business people. And that is true, that's not a myth. These people are founders, they're business people, they don't understand all the legalese, you don't have to speak in legalese, you speak in plain English. I think I've said this on my videos. And that's not all the time. Sometimes like these companies are a little bigger, they're in their later stages, they're like trying to get more and more money, they're about to be bought or whatever. And like sometimes they do have internal counsel um, and that's like a whole nother conversation. So next thing, I uh, don't know if this is a myth or not. One of the things about this practice that is attractive that I would encourage or that I would promote for people that want to start doing this is that there's just so much room in this space, I think to just create your own thing, your own practice. There's a lot of room for that because there are a lot of different types of people who are starting new businesses. So there are people I've worked with who have, and this takes some time, like they're usually like have been practicing for like five or six or seven years before you really start to have your niche. But there's one person that I've seen practice is like pretty much veterans. He created that for himself. Like he, I think he's a veteran, I don't know. He likes to work with veterans, so he does. And that's like the kind of work he seeks out. There's one lady that she is into fashion, 
So she seeks out fashion related businesses and does their financings for them and like is their corporate lawyer. She's able to do that. I've met people that just like do different things. Like there's one person that she has like a lot of women, a lot of women clients, um, which is not common in this <laughs> space. Like most of these clients are white male. You know, every time I work with someone, I go look at like their LinkedIn, stalk them real quick, I look at their bio. A lot of people that are attracted to this space, I realize that for law school, they started a company. Or there's one, there's someone that's like, I'm working with who is doing this job, but she also runs a company. <laughs> like, so they're attracted to the entrepreneurship because they are entrepreneurs, like things like that. So I find that even on my end of stuff, like the firm end, they seem to be a little more interesting on both ends of the deal. So yeah, okay, next. <laughs> so I think I hit all the main things I want to hit. I really wanted to just explain that like this is a numbers practice. I think that that's not popular, it's not publicized about this, but it is. There are a lot of venture capital financing. That's the bread and butter of your practice when this is your area, your dominant area. I want to explain that it can be stressful in terms of just really keeping a strict, strict watch on how much time you spend on stuff. Having to increase the cap is always like a conversation. So I wanted to stress that, but also wanted to stress that the upsides that people say are true too. People leave my firm other firms like it and they go do like real interesting stuff for startups i like read where people go after and i'm like oh okay like that's pretty cool what you're doing so it's not just like we're going to an investment bank or we're going to a pe firm some people do that i'm sure but that's not the majority at least not that i see but yeah the pros are there too and that's another reason why people want to get involved They're like oh i want to like do something i want they want big law to be the jump start for something more exciting for them. And I do think that this is a good space to be in for that. So I hope this is helpful for somebody who maybe didn't even know this type of legal practice existed, or maybe you're thinking about jumping into it and you're like, I don't know if it's really what I think it is. Hopefully this sheds more light on that. Hope you enjoyed this video. Like this video, comment down below if you have any follow-up questions for me and I was gonna say we'll see you next time, like some here myself. So I'll see you next time. Probably with Sam by me, maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know our next joint video. Um, we have a lot of ideas, but whoo, November and December for us are like pretty busy and we're kind of like traveling, but not necessarily together. So we're gonna have to figure these schedules out, but we will get y'all some content. So, all right, see y'all next time. Bye.